Will you turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 3, please? Acts chapter 3, and I'll begin my reading right away, beginning in verse 1, as we read through verse 12. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask for alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms? And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered and said unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look you so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we have made this man to walk? Now, Father, we ask your blessing upon our time together. We pray for the teaching of your Holy Spirit, for the power of your Holy Spirit to apply these things to our hearts and minds. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost is the day when the Holy Spirit descended upon the believers and they were baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ and the church was born. Fifty days after the resurrection. Fifty days, forty days, Jesus was with them and was teaching them. And he said, tarry in Jerusalem now that I'm leaving until you be endued with power from on high. And then the day came, and the Holy Spirit descended from heaven. God come and made, came and made his abode with his people, as he makes his abode with people even today. Pentecost as such could never be reenacted, it could be reenacted, but it could never be repeated. D.L. Moody said, it's a specimen day. But I want you to know that the filling of the Holy Spirit is something that is to occur daily. We read in Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, we've already been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He has taken up his residence within us. Our bodies are the holy of holies compared to the Old Testament temple. Why? This admonition, be filled. Actually, from the Greek, it is be being filled. Constantly realize that we are not our own. Our bodies are not our own. We're bought for the price. And God himself dwells within us. And all of our life should be colored by this and guided by this. Turn with me also to the book of Luke for just a moment. And the 11th chapter, Jesus prayed a lot. Now, why would he, as God, pray to God in heaven? Well, he made himself or became a man. Independently, he did not use his own power and attributes, but depended upon the power of the Father in his life and in his ministry. But he prayed in the morning, and the disciples saw this and heard this. And during the day, he walked into the answers to his prayer. And the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Well, he did. And he taught them that which we recognize as the Lord's Prayer. This is just a tad different than that given to us in the book of Matthew, the fifth chapter, 
Here it is, uh, it is shorter, but it is basically the same. Now, I don't believe, because even Jesus said this, when ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I don't think that this is necessarily a prayer that we pray every time we pray. Now, when I was a boy, we had a, we had a church. We were in a Baptist church, and they had the Lord's Prayer that we prayed in unison every Sunday. I don't think that's the way Jesus meant it. He said, here's a pattern prayer. Here's how you pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What it is saying is God is worthy to be worshipped. And we should not just come quickly with a quickie prayer into his presence. Lord, give me this and give me that. But we need to realize that he is God. He is Lord. But he does want to answer prayer. And we are to, to recognize this as we come into his presence. Now, you don't have to have a worship service every time you go to prayer. That is, if you're prayed up. I mean, there are times when you don't go into a worship experience when you're praying. For example, if you're driving and something happens and you skid out, you don't say, Father, we know that you're worthy of all praise and we know that you're great. No, you say, Lord, help me. This last winter, actually it was spring, and the roads were icy. And I should have been driving to Buick and I should have been driving slower. But I wasn't. I drove that little that little Chevy. It's a gutsy little girl, and I like it. But I was driving too fast, and going around a curve, I lost it. What did I do? And I, I was sliding and slipping, and Mary was screaming and hollering. What was I going to do? I didn't, I didn't say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy. I said, Lord, help me! You know? And uh, we can. But this is a pattern of prayer. Then he gives some illustrations of this, beginning in verse 5. He said there was a man that had a friend come, may have been a relative, but he came about midnight, and here the man didn't have anything, and, the man, and this other friend was hungry. What was he going to do? Well, he went to his neighbor's house. He knew him real well, you know, and knocked on the door, and the neighbor looked out the window and wiped the sleepy bugs out of his eyes. What do you want? He said, help me. I've got a neighbor, a friend that has come, and he's hungry. I don't have any food. The cupboard's bare. Lend me some food. And the man said, get lost. He said, we're in bed. The children are in bed. And just go away. Get, come on back tomorrow, probably, is what he said. But he kept on knocking. Help me. I need food. And finally, he said, the man broke down. He said, you wake up the whole neighborhood. And went down and gave him the food. God's that way, but we have to do more than just say, Lord, give me all I need, amen. And sometimes God wants to know how serious we are about things. Then he went on and said, what, what if you have children? What if you have children? And they ask, bread, I'm hungry. Or grandchildren, they come in, Grandma, I'm hungry. There's a cookie jar. And, uh, you know, said, if they ask bread, you don't give them a stone? If they ask a fish, you don't give them a scorpion? They said, your heavenly Father knows how to give good gifts. But notice what he says in verse 13. If ye then, being evil, or in other words, carnal, fleshly people, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? You say, what do you mean, ask for the Holy Spirit? He, he abides within me. I'm sealed until I go home. Just like in Ephesians 5.18, be filled or be being filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. He is God. Acts 5 tells us this. He's called God. He's the third person of the Trinity. Jesus said, if any man love us, love me, the Father and I will come and make our abode with you in John's gospel. So dwelling within us is the whole power of God, the Godhead. But God is a gentleman. 
He does not force himself upon us. Most of the time we get so busy we don't think a bit about God dwells within me. What about when you have bad thoughts about somebody? Right then you have to stop and say, Lord, I've sinned. Blessed Holy Spirit, put a, put a lock on my mind, on my attitudes, on my spirit. Help me, God, I need you now. And just like when I was skidding out, and boy, that little shivy was doing some fancy moving around. We finally ended up back up into a snowbank, and there we sat. What are we going to do now? We couldn't get out of there. Two guys stopped by and pick up, and they said, there's nothing to hook on to. We can't get you out. Well, we looked at each other, and somebody else pulled up in two pickups. They said they looked underneath, and then they lifted the hood, and they said, yeah, there's something there, and they pulled us out. I'm not sure where I was going with that, but <laughs> bear, bear with me. I'll get back on, on track one, one of these days. But you see, folks, we need the Lord, and he's always with us. Even when we do something stupid, like drive too fast on a highway that's snow-covered, you can't even see the lines. Lord, Lord, that woman you gave me. <laughs> but we need to realize, folks, that we're not our own. Our bodies, we belong to him, body, soul, and spirit. But we get so caught up in things. Whether it's the soaps, or whether it's soup at noon. We get so caught up in, in, in other things. We don't think about God living within us. And then we hit a mud puddle. We hit a slippery spot, black ice in life. What are we going to do? Well, God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm just thankful that I ended up in a snowbank rather than into another car. And when the devil comes into our mind with a, with a thought that ought not to be there, right then we ought to stop and say, Lord, I need your help. Blessed Holy Spirit, put a guard on my mind or my tongue. Lord, put a guard on my tongue. God is with us at all times, and he wants to guide us. Okay, we come back to the, uh, to the text. The Holy Spirit descended on the day of Pentecost. And he came down with a roar. And all were filled with the Holy Spirit. And all began to speak in other languages. And the verses following that, in the second chapter, talk about the many people from the many countries and the many languages involved there coming to worship at Jerusalem at Pentecost. All of a sudden, they could hear the gospel. They can hear the message of Christ from these many people in their various languages. That's what tongues is all about. Paul said, I speak in tongues more than all of you. But Paul went from country to country and language to language, and God gave him the ability not only to understand their language, but also to speak it. But they heard and three, when Peter preached, 3,000 of them came to Christ. Now we come to verse 1 back in chapter 3 of Acts. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Pentecost was born in prayer. Come with me back to the first chapter. Jesus was ascending back to glory. And in verse 9, as he ascended, a cloud and chapter 1, received him out of their sight. And they were looking like this and craning their necks. And an angel said, why stand here looking up? The same Jesus will come again. But he told you, tarry in Jerusalem until you be with, endued with power from on high. So they went back and they went up into an upper room in verse 13. 
whether this is the same one that Jesus and the disciples held the Passover, I'm not sure. It doesn't say. It doesn't matter. But here for 10 days, 120 people were praying. How do you pray for 10 days? Well, first of all, it would take some of us a while to get, you know, reacquainted with God. God, I'm John Hill. Remember me? Uh, yeah, I do. Lord, I think I remember you too. And so we get reacquainted. Then we pray as Psalm 139 tells us, search us, O God, try us. See if there be any wicked way in us. And pray for personal revival. Pray for a closeness. Pray for one another. But spending time in prayer. Now imagine what could happen in a situation like that if we did that as well. And then finally, the Spirit of God descended upon them as Jesus had promised. Now they're praying again and going into the house of, or going into the house of God at the time of prayer. On the way in, they encounter a man who's disabled. He had been crippled from the time of birth. He had never walked. And his only means of support was holding his hand out and saying, alms, alms, and sat there every day. They brought him to the temple. He sat there and hoping that people would throw in a coin. Then they'd come and get him in the evening and take him home. That was his only means of food or shelter or anything else. They saw this man, and the man said, alms, alms. Peter said, look up. The man looked up expecting to, to receive something from them. But instead, verse 6, Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And Peter put his hand down like this, lifted him up, and God strengthened his, his feet and ankle bones. And that man was able to walk and run and jump, and he was happy. But you know what? All of the gold in the world didn't compare to what that man experienced right then. What would he want more than anything else? In fact, the Bible says, what would a man give in exchange for his soul if I gained the whole world? George Beverly Shea used to sing that beautiful song, and had not Jesus. What would I have? You see? But folks, I want us to see too that the Holy Spirit of God is given to us that we might be the type of people that we ought to be, that we might be, uh, that we might be the best person that's possible to be. There are no people exactly alike in this congregation this morning. Just as our fingerprints are different, so are our personalities, our dispositions, so are the way we've been raised, and we come into the gospel, into the church as different people. But you know, God can take that and make that a beautiful bouquet in his hand. God can take you and use you. God can take you and, and use you as nobody else can do what you can do. Nobody else can be who you can be. But you have to put yourself in the hand of the Lord. But you don't have to pray, Lord, from heaven touch me. God's right within you. And yes, we pray to the Father in Jesus' name, but sometimes, you see, the Holy Spirit is God. And we can just say, blessed Holy Spirit, help me. Bless me, guide me, give me wisdom. You're not in any way taking away from the Father or the Son. God is within us, and let us never forget. Well, this man got all excited, and so did the people around him and all. And like I said, this was more than gold to him, but it ought to be to us too. Don't you, haven't you wished at times that you could be a better person? God, you know my heart. You know I want to live for you, but <clears throat> down we go. Lord, you know this tongue I want to dedicate to you, and then suddenly it's cutting somebody down. Lord, I want to be like my grandma was. I want to be like my mother was. I want to be like that one Christian who was just special 
And you know you can be? God wants to make something beautiful. We are his workmanship. And he's seeking to, to mold us and make us into something beautiful. But folks, if you can help somebody, if you can give a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, if you can go and encourage someone, and though I do not believe that anyone has the gift of healing today, I do believe that some people have a heart and they are a prayer warrior in, in this business of healing souls and healing bodies. And I do believe that God can use you in that way. I do not believe that health is a part of what, what the Lord uh, bought for us on Calvary. I don't believe health is. Some of the finest Christians that I've known through the years have been, I mean, their bodies have been a wreck. I had the chance to talk twice to Johnny Eric Tadis. Can't even get the name straight now. That was, that's been a few years back. And she was diving one day as a teenager, and she hit a rock or something with her head, and it just snapped her vertebrae in her neck. Now she's completely paralyzed from here down. But what a beautiful, wonderful woman. She paints pictures, but she puts the paintbrush in her mouth like this. She writes, but she puts the pencil in her mouth like that. But it doesn't affect her speaking. It doesn't affect her warmth. She's a beautiful, beautiful person. Some of you knew Reverend Charles Hubbard. Charlie Hubbard uh, prayed. I mean, he was in an accident. And he was paralyzed from here down. He had strength in his hands and arms, but nothing from there down. And he prayed, and he even went around all over America to faith healers, but nobody could help him. God said, Charlie, I need, I need somebody just like you, a preacher in a wheelchair. And he could wheel into a, a hospital room. And here was that person feeling so sorry for themselves because of what the doctor had just said. And here's a man in a lot worse shape than him wheeling in and so buoyant in spirit and praying with them. I had lunch with son Steve Friday. Steve is the one that was in the accident and burned so severely. He's in pain constantly. He's working, continuing to work, even though he's under pain medication. What a buoyant spirit the man has. What a beautiful man he has. Some of you have met him. God doesn't heal everyone. We're told in the book of James, in the fifth chapter, that we are to pray for the sick. Anoint them and pray for them. And if they have committed some sin, it will be forgiven them, and perhaps they'll be healed. But we have to pray according to the will of God. Now, if you're praying for someone who is sick, pray definitely. God, raise them up. But God has a will in all of this, you know. Our times are in God's hands. But you could be used in that. 2 Corinthians in chapter 1 says, the comfort that God has comforted you with. Minister to other people in that same way. Have you gone through some terrible experience? God has brought you through. You prayed through and God has brought you through. Now here's another brother or sister going through the same thing. and They don't know what to do. They're all upset. And you come and put your arm around them and tell them how God helped you. God will see you through. The, the sad thing is that Christians, too, forget when they're going through deep waters. God, I need you. And sometimes we have to get put on our back before we'll look up. Did you ever hear of the song, He washed my eyes with tears that I might see? Beautiful song. And sometimes that's the only way God could get our attention. We'll come down to verse 13 for a moment. The God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers has glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate. Now, Paul, uh, Peter is preaching. 
and you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God has raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And he jammed the sword into that crowd listening because some of them had cried out just 50, year, 50 days before this, away with him, crucify him, we'll not have this man to rule over us. Or others walking by and watching him writhing in pain there on the cross were throwing things at his teeth. Now, Peter just throws in the sword ruthlessly. You murdered him. And they were cut. The Holy Spirit work is also convicting sinners and bringing them to Christ. The reason more people don't get saved is because they don't convict. They don't get convicted. They're not convinced that they're a sinner, that they need the Lord. And so then in verse 19, repent you therefore. I imagine some of these people began to rile, wiggle and some began to cry and some began to see for the first time what they had done, that they needed the Lord. Repent you therefore and be converted. Turn around, face God. Realize who you are, that you're lost, you're hell bound. That your sins may be blotted out, that the times of refreshing may uh, come from the presence of the Lord. And he invited them to repent and to come to the Lord. 2,000 more did. Now the figure of the church is up to 5,000, 3,000 when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. Now a total according to the fourth chapter now, a total of 5,000 saved, sealed with the Holy Spirit on their way to heaven. Oh, the power of the word. Turn with me in closing to a verse in the book of Hebrews, or listen closely, the fourth chapter and verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's why Paul said in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power, the dynamite of God, the explosive power of God within our lives. Oh, this book. Not only beautiful stories on how to live, but the power is there too. This book is the power of God, the written power of God. And as you read it, the Holy Spirit can lift its words right off of the page and either comfort you or slap you down. We have an excellent pianist at the other church, not saying you're not, I don't mean that, you kids. But this girl has been semi-pro for a number of years. And she was playing just just before the service, and I went up and started playing Peter, Peter, Pumpkin Eater, or whatever it was that, you know, you play with two fingers. And she just reached over, slapped my hand like, <laughs> like that. Uh, sometimes we need that. Sometimes that's what God has to do to us. But are you filled in walking with the Spirit of God? Sometimes he'll take the word and slap us. Not only our hands, but maybe right the side of the head. But maybe we need it. You are a walking, living house of Christ. To be filled with the Holy Spirit. Blessed Holy Spirit, I need you today. I want you to live your life out through me. I want to be like Jesus. It ought to be our constant prayer. John says, you know him, talking about the Holy Spirit. No, we don't. He's a complete stranger. I don't have Alzheimer's yet, just Parkzheimer's. But every once in a while, somebody will come up to you. You remember me? <laughs> no, but I remember your breath. Uh, but no, I don't, you know. Uh, we're, we're that way with the Holy Spirit, folks. We don't, we don't really know God. Oh, how we ought to get or take time to get acquainted with him. I know Mary pretty well. We've been together for a long time now. I don't know her as well as she knows me or thinks she knows me. She thinks she knows what I'm thinking even. Thank God she doesn't. 
We ought to be that close. To, we ought to be that close to God too. Let's pray. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. A name for loving us and bringing us to yourself. Thank you, blessed Holy Spirit, that one day in convicting power, you use the word of God to bring us to yourself. Now we pray that each of our hearts and lives may be open to you and that, blessed Holy Spirit, we may be filled with you. But we know that you cannot continue to live and to operate in a dirty vessel. Help us to clean up our lives and to become as godly as is possible for us because, Lord, you know us. And I pray that you would search us and try us and cleanse us. And blessed Holy Spirit, take over in every part of our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.